Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show. This week we are talking about short selling, how to profit in a falling market. And this is one of those subjects that often causes confusion for people and often maybe a bit of a bad taste that it's people simply looking to profit from other people's misery. Neither of those things have to be the case. And as you go through this particular interview, you're going to learn some new skills and more importantly, some techniques which can help you protect yourself from risk and put yourself in the enviable position of becoming what we call an all seasons investor. Make sure you take plenty of notes, but as always, do take plenty of action. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show with me, your host, Andrew Baxter, and as always, my offsider and co-host, Mitchell Lorenzo. Good to be here, Mr. B. Thanks for having me and looking awfully dapper today. Topic of conversation is a little different and we're going to challenge a lot of people's thoughts right now in this episode because we're going to be talking about short selling, mm -hmm. mastering the art of picking the stock price moving down and profiting from it. Yes, it is possible. Oh, it most certainly is possible uh, and is, uh, is a particular trading strategy I've been involved with for an awful long time. I love it because more than anything, if you think about this as a sort of proviso for the rest of our interview today, most people are pretty comfortable with making money when markets go up, but they don't go up all the time. So learning a set of skills which can enable you to profit when markets fall enables you to become what I would consider to be, let's call it an all seasons investor. So it doesn't matter what season of the year we're in, as far as the market goes, you've got the ability in your kit bag to be able to profit. So it's such a massively valuable skill. Now let's talk about how it actually works as an introduction. So we know it's profiting from falling share prices, but the mechanics behind it are a little confusing. They can be. It's not logical because people go, well, how? How, how, how do you do that? So I'll try and make this as, uh, as simple as I can. And so short selling effectively is where you sell something that you don't own, ideally at a high price, and subsequently you buy it back later on at a lower price. Now, if you think about something, if you sell something before you own it, and buy it back afterwards, net net, you're square. You've sold something, you put it back, you're square. In just the same way as somebody that bought shares and sold them are square as well, they're holding no position. All you're looking to do is trade the price difference. So if you sold something at 20 and you're able to buy it back at 16, you've picked up $4 a share. And you've actually borrowed these shares too for our listeners. So you yep. borrowed the shares, sold them, bought them back and then return those shares, the difference is your profit. Exactly right. So, you know, they then go, well, where do you borrow the shares from? And the answer is typically large institutions. So if you think about an insurance company like, say, CGU, they, they would have literally billions of dollars worth of shares sitting in their uh, vault, so to speak. Uh, and as, as owner of those shares, they pick up their dividend twice a year, so they're happy doing that. But if they're able to lend that stock to you, what they can then charge is a lending fee, it's called stock lending. And so they're able to get a little, little bit more cream on the cake and, and an edge on their return by being able to lend stock that they already own out. There are a couple of challenges with that. Number one, you've got to pay for it. And number two is they may recall that stock at short notice to say, look, we need it back because we're selling down our holding, in which case you, you literally have to get that stock back to them that day. Okay. So there are some risks around that. Now, speaking of risks a little more, we know that if you buy into a share price, and the share price goes up, you make money. Mm. If it goes down from where you bought it, you lose money. Mm. Short selling, obviously the opposite. The biggest risk that I'm aware of, of course, with short selling as any of our listeners would be, is if the share price goes blistering higher and you've bet on it going down, you can find yourself in a bit of trouble. Well, that's exactly right. So let's say using our previous number, you sold it at 20 and instead of it falling, it moved up to 30. So you've sold something for 20, you've got to buy it back at 30, you're down $10 a share, which obviously is, is fairly punishing and not much fun. So like any kind of investment, you've got to be on top of your anal analysis to make sure um, you know, you're in what you would consider to be uh, a good quality opportunity. I think it's also very important to recognize that you need risk management in there too, because if you're wrong, how quickly do you cut being wrong? Uh, because you know, markets inherently have an upward bias uh, if you look at the any major indices, probably with the exception of the Nikkei, um, they all trend higher over a period of time. And if you're betting against that overall trend, you've got to be very good with your timing and pick the eyes out of when it's pulling back. If you stay in there and it keeps rolling against you, then yes, it can get pretty expensive, especially when you consider that shorting typically you know, has a five to one leverage component as well. So it's a, you only put down a 20% deposit uh, to, to be able to short. So you geared up five times too. Oh, so yeah. it can really bite you if you're not careful. And unlimited risk too. So we know if we buy shares at $10 and it goes to zero, your net loss is $10 a mm -hmm. share. When you short the stock, the share price can technically raise or rise to yeah. any amount. I think in Nvidia, for example, I mean, that would be, that would be financially devastating. Oh yeah. Yeah, because mm. then you're on the hook for it. Mm. Now, what are the benefits of shorting? So you mentioned leverage, which is very attractive mm. to investors. How does that work? 
Well, you put down a small amount relative to the position size that you're trading. So let's say you wanted a short $100,000 worth of shares, you'd pay a $20,000 deposit, uh, which like any margin loan, which would be the reverse of a short, there, there is something that's called a variation margin. So if that trade deteriorates, you'd be required to put more money into your account to meet that margin requirement. So you, you can't go too big on your position. You've got to be prudent in terms of the position sizing. Um, obviously, the brokerage fee is on the position size in its entirety. So, you know, you do pay a reasonable chunk of brokerage, even though, you know, you're using a small amount of cash. Um, so that's something to be minded of, too. The other side of the coin is, you know, if you've got a share that effectively drops to zero, um, how do you buy it back to close the trade? Yeah, I've never thought about that, actually. Mm. And, and, and physically, you can't do that. So... You could be a little bit smart about this, and I've, I've seen this a few times, particularly um, you know with stocks like Pazminko when they when they when they hit the skids, uh, and and how does the ATO then tax it? So let's say you sold something for ten bucks, it's dropped to zero, you're unable to close the position out, so it's an unrealized gain. You can't be taxed on unrealized gains, and you get to collect all the money that you sold. Yeah, no, the ATO don't like missing anything. Okay, so yeah. what they will actually do is book it at the volume weighted average price of the last day it traded and they'll deem it that you got out of it at that price and then tax you on your gains there's, there no, you there's no sidestep but technically yeah it's an unrealized gain very nice mm. so now we understand the mechanics of shorting stock and what let's it is let's put it a different way because it it, 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 it it is a concept that a lot of people struggle with so let's say for argument's sake um, we were next door neighbours and I was having a party it was over Easter the bottle shop shut and I've run out of alcohol so I ask you can I borrow a slab of beer you give me a case of beer case of VB for argument's sake, you pass over the fence uh, and being the ruthless capitalist I am at my party, I'm charging that out at 10 bucks a bottle. So people are buying my beer at $10 a bottle. Now, when the bottle shop opens again on Tuesday, you don't care that I sold my VB for 10 bucks a bottle. You just want your case of VB back. So if I'm able to do that at $6 a bottle, I'm clearing four bucks. I like that. You've got your case back. You don't care. You've got the quantity back that you that you lent out to me, not the, the, the value of it, just the quantity, which is the key thing. Uh, I've had a great party and I've made some money on the way through. So it's a different way of looking at it, maybe making me thirsty thinking about that. Yeah, very nice. So what are some key indicators, AB? So if you are looking to identify a short sale of some mm. stock to profit on its way down, what are you actually looking for? Look, there are a few things. Technically, as I mentioned previously, you've got to be on top of your timing. It's one of those trades where if your timing's out, it's going to hurt quite badly. So, yeah, a good layering in of technical indicators there. And I like to use uh, RSI 9, actually, to be specific, uh, for a negative divergence. So if the RSI is starting to roll over and the share price is flat, that's usually a pretty good indicator if it's a resistance that things are rolling over. But I also think rather than technical indicators, and everyone's got their own edge in terms of, of how they build their systems out, um, I think fundamentally Fundamentals can be massively beneficial when it comes to shorting. There are certain stocks you can short. Um, you know, if you think about 9-11 um, after, after the terror uh, attacks then, um, you weren't able to short airline stocks after that because you know, some of the research would suggest that Al-Qaeda were shorting airline stocks and profiting from you know, the subsequent demise. So you, know, you can not short airline stocks, they're on a block list, um, and, and some other companies are that are in a sensitive uh, type of position. Um, so there is a list of what you can and can't short. Secondly, um, specifically um, within there, looking at where fundamentals can really help you. Um, I'll give you an example of a trade. So a number of years ago now, we had the Hendra virus, which brought an end to horse racing and the ability to move horses around Australia. Now, one of the companies that typically profits from horses being moved around Australia is Tabcorp because of the betting stuff. And, uh, and so getting a good short on tab court when that news broke, you think, OK, there's no horse racing. What does that mean? Well, it means if there's no horse racing, there's no horse betting. And if there's no horse betting, that means a drop in revenue. And if the revenue is dropping, the price will drop. That's how you join the dots mm -hmm. uh, as a trader. Gotcha. Got short on it. And yeah, that was, that was, a, that was a fantastic trade. So there's a really good example of, of, um, of that. If you think back to you know, the pandemic, being able to go short on things like cruise liners, for example, people can't travel. Another great way of, uh, of banking, hotel chains, those sorts of things. So there's a good way of linking fundamentals in as well. So I think fundamentals and technicals do play a pretty important part in, in lining yourself up for a short trade. Indeed. And if I can use my own example, I remember through mm. COVID, just as it was happening, fundamentally speaking, weak environment, no one could travel yeah. naturally, of course. Technically speaking, stock was in a downtrend. It was Sydney Airport when yep. it was actually listed. I remember I took a short trade on that and subsequently the price fell as mm. I connected those dots. And it was a great trade, made some great money. Most people sat on the sidelines and or losing, mm. whereas I know we're able to be on the front foot with that trade and made some great money. Here's the thing. A lot of people, everyone looks, but only some people see. 
So we all look at the same news, we just interpret it in different ways. And if you've got confidence and, uh, and I think more importantly, consistency in the process you use, it's very easy to make that decision. Whereas when there's a series of unknowns on the board, you know, as a pandemic, as you mentioned, people are like, oh, what's going to happen with this? Nobody really knows. And it can create an inaction when in actual fact, those circumstances are ripe uh, for the taking. If you've if you've spent the time building the muscle memory, the trading skill set to be able to profit from it. And of course, yeah, the flip side of the coin is there are a lot of people that will then flag efficacy concerns with that going, well, how, how's it fair that you're making money when everyone else is losing money? Because, you know, if a price is going down, most investors are losing. And I think when you look at that, um, you know, really objectively, really everyone's investment decision and journey is their own choice. Everyone gets a choice of being educated. Everyone gets a choice of being skilled. Um, to a greater or lesser extent. And if you're someone that's invested in your education to learn how to do that, well, where's the ethical challenge with that? It was an opportunity that was available for everybody. I also think it's going to happen whether you short sell or not. If, if the buyer appetite in the market dries up, which is effectively what you're looking for with a short selling trade, the share price is going to fall anyway. Whether or not you're shorting it, you just happen to be capitalising on what it's doing. So I think from an efficacy perspective, you know, people can get on the wrong side of the interpretation of that as well. And again, you know, the stock market is, is, is the secondary market. It's not the company itself. It's the shares that are traded around that company. And they will move on a daily basis, irrespective of what the company is doing. So you're not having a direct impact on the business. You're just simply seeking to capitalize on movements, weakness of demand in, in the share price. There are short sale restrictions too for short periods of time. So say a company has really poor earnings, mm -hmm. often the market can place a short sale restriction. So you yep. can't do it anyway, which means that as a good thing, institutions with yep. big, big amounts of money can't get in and push the price yep. down. And, and, and there are other rules that on, on a, you know, we're starting to get to a more granular level of the discussion, I suppose, in that if you think about in the US, there's the sidecar rule or the uptick rule, whereby if you put a short trade on, in order for that trade to get filled, you can not put a lower price in and, and, and capitulate pricing moving downwards. You can only get set on an uptick. In other words, if the price moves up to that level, the idea of that again is to try and prevent um, you know, substantial weakness in markets and create an orderly market. So there are safeguards that are in play to, I guess, protect, um, protect investors from the skullduggery that can go on around markets. Oh well, yeah. So question to you, you mentioned ethical concerns. Mm. What about legal concerns? Are there any to be aware of? I think like any kind of investing, everyone's bound by um, you know, the legalities of insider trading, for example. If you're privy to information, you, you simply can't act on that. And that's, that's a given, I think, that we've, we've got to accept. Um, again, it comes down to individual skills at, at, at reading the tape. Legality-wise, there are some instruments, we've talked about the airline sector, for example, that you can't short. There's the uptick rule in, in market trade that means the price has got to tick up in order for you to get set on a short. Um, but also, you know, there are other restrictions that can kick in from time to time. And you might see this on your trading platform where uh, I know on ours there's a little red S that comes up against yeah. the stock, which says it's temporarily suspended from being able to be shorted. So again, this is all designed very carefully to, to, to try and mitigate um, adverse action within markets that can, can really penalise investors. Uh, and, and look, when it's done right, it creates liquidity in markets, which is a fair and orderly market at the end of the day. And, and it's just hard for people to wrap their head around. You don't need to short sell stocks. There are other routes that you can take if, and I'll be very minded of the way I, I couch this, I'm not going to say this is a highbrow conversation because I don't particularly think it is, but it's a hard one for people to get their head. Can't be highbrow. It's you and I having a chat, so yeah, it's no, definitely not two that. footy heads playing. You know, it's, not. It's, it's not going to be highbrow. But you know, a lot of people struggle with the logic uh, behind it, or, or well, how do I borrow a stock? And your broker can facilitate that. That's part of what their job is through stock lending. But these days, you know, there are so many different avenues you could trade CFDs, for example, which have made it very, very easy to short. And I think, you know. No question about it. That's probably one of the biggest advantages to com uh, CFDs or contracts for difference is that ease of being able to short. Um, you've got the ability to buy put options. If you wanted to go to the options market, you can trade uh, the futures market either long or short. If you wanted to do that, you can buy bearish ETFs if you wanted to, like to participate in that. And that's probably, for me, I think, as an entry port for people into, into the world of becoming not a shorter, but an all seasons investor where they're looking to profit if markets are moving down rather than being a shorter, if we can use the, the differentiation between the two. Um, so if you're trading the NASDAQ, for example, 
Um, and it's been on an absolute tear. And at some point it starts to creak and groan and looks like it's showing signs of weakness. And, you know, and the, there are plenty of factors in the world that may, may unsettle that right now. Um, there are various ways that you can you can go there. You could trade PSQ or you could trade a geared version like S triple Q, which is a, a meat and potatoes. Well, maybe not S triple Q, but PSQ is a, is a meat and potatoes ETF that you can simply buy that is a bearish tracker so it goes that, up if it the goes market up, goes if the down. Market goes so down. easy buy and sell at yeah. normal. You know, if I take, you know, using that across a different market, take China, for example, where I've got a fairly bearish outlook for Chinese equities, um, you can trade Yang, which is the triple geared, probably not to be messed around with, bearish ETF on, on the Shanghai exchange, traded on the New York Stock Exchange, or sorry, I beg your pardon, on the NASDAQ. Uh, and so you've got one place you can go to buy an instrument that gives you broad-based bearish exposure geared towards Chinese equity. So you can make it as sophisticated as you want it to be. Indeed. Um, and it's down to investor choice where they go. The key message more than anything isn't like, you know, you're sailing around in a pirate ship looking for opportunities to, to pillage your way through the market. The simple fact is that markets do not always go up. Now, that, that's a pretty hard statement to make when we've, we've had the year that we had last year and the start that we've had to this year. But these runs do come to an end for a period of time, whether that's based on valuations, whether it's based on a substantial change in the economy, news flow, global events, a war, any of those, an election outcome, any of those different things which can unsettle markets. And when that happens, how well prepared are you for it? Are you someone's going to go, oh, that's right, I'll just ride this out and keep going? Or are you like, yeah, maybe, maybe I could pick up a little bit here on the downside as the market moves down? Uh, or, or use it as a hedging tool against your broader portfolio of stocks. So, I mean, if you've got a really diversified portfolio of, um, of Australian equities, buying a bearish ETF on the Aussie index, if, if you feel the economy is looking a bit shaky, but you don't want to sell your shares for tax reasons or whatever other reason you may have, then just pick up a bit of a bearish ETF, which will enable you to hedge some of the risk out. So this isn't just about smash and grab opportunity. It's actually a very, very, very powerful risk management tool when it's used correctly. You, like everything, though, must understand the rules of the game you're trying to play, because if you don't understand the rules of this game, you'll get hurt very, very quickly. Oh, yeah. AB, really good insight. Mastering the art of short selling. I think our listeners have learned plenty today. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Anytime, Mitch. There you have it, guys. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe. Most importantly, hit the notification button, and we'll look forward to hosting you next week.